So we we just we we're just talking about the, the the local church and the power of the local church and you know we make a difference. We talk about being in this school. This is an amazing divine timing of God to to plant this school here. Yeah. Because the ruling principalities and powers <coughs> in any place is the church. Yes. The church is God's set ruling principality and power in the Holy Spirit. We get so taken up with principalities and powers. And I want to come to a verse that I can't wait to say. That it's in 1, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. It says, And the wisdom and the power of the principalities and powers that are coming to nothing. Amen. They're coming to nothing. It's not increasing in dimension and power. It's coming to nothing. There's only one thing increasing. Yes. It's the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. In, in, uh, in um, Isaiah 9 it says, For Of the increase of his government and peace there is what? No, no end. No but the principles and powers of this earth are coming to nothing. Which prophecy are you going to take? Yes. Which prophecy are you going to set your mind on? Which heart and mind set are you going to have in the kingdom of God? I'm setting my heart and mind on the increase of God's government. And whether it's other religions or it's ISIS or anything, God is going to penetrate those places with his great and powerful love. And he can turn a nation in a day. He even asked Jeremiah, can I turn a nation in a day? Duh! Yeah. <laughs> God is God and he loves this planet. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all who believe in him. You know what? We read just recently that, that in Islam, if I can say it, I don't know how that's going to go, but the fact is that because people are seeing the shocking cruelty and violence that's being done through some of the representation or sex or extremists or whatever, they're becoming disillusioned with their religion now this is the point. They become disillusioned with their religion and leaving it. But they're not going to the Christian church because they're disillusioned with that too. They're becoming atheists. Come on. And we are the people that change the world. Without the church in this, in this world, this place would go downhill and be left to the enemy to destroy. But we are salt and light on the planet. Amen. We are the people of life and truth. And, and as uh, Steve said, Steve, Steve, I saw you standing up here with a rod inside of your lightning going up and down like that. <laughs> Let it out, bro. But as Steve said, and I was sitting there thinking and meditating, I thought, the life is the light. The life of Jesus is my light. I'm alive in light. I'm not in the dark. And I walk around in light and in his resurrection life, and we influence places. I believe that, you know, and this is what I've heard even in PNG, when the church moves in somewhere, the demons move out. And in PNG in Bougainville, we heard stories about those who were old enough who knew when the missionaries came into their area in Bougainville and other places. There was witchcraft, darkness, uh, all kinds of horrible, horrible stuff. And they said, they said this, when the missionaries came into our village, we saw the demons leave. Come on, come on, come on. This is a fact. We are so mentally affected in our discernment of demons. The point about discernment is that we should discern angels. We should be discerning the things of what the Spirit is doing. Our discernment is, you see, <laughs> you see, we are not just thermometers that test the temperature of the spiritual situation. We're thermostats to change it. Amen. Are you listening? Yes. Are you taking notes? Yes. Why aren't you? <laughs> because you're too good to listen to. <laughs> you see, an air conditioner changes the atmosphere. Your thermometer tells you the temperature. We're not here just to, to sense and to determine the temperature of spiritual life. We're here to change it. And you're doing that here in this place. This church is a powerful, present, relative expression of that. We've moved in here and what's happened? Blessing has come on this school.
More kids have joined the school. I believe it is because they've opened their hearts to us and moved us in here that we, God's blessing on us has now affected the atmosphere in this place. We are thermostats in this school. That's enough. I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> Come on. Let's turn to um, Ephesians 3. <clears throat> I just believe so powerfully that the church is rising in the last days and Satan is going down. I predict and I prophesy Satan is falling like lightning. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. When the disciples went out and preached the kingdom of God and healed the sick and raised the dead and cleansed the lepers, he said, what did he say? I saw Satan falling like lightning. When the church got out in the dimension and power of, the, of heaven on earth, he cut th they cut through something that caused Satan to fall like lightning. Yeah. Let him fall and let him crash badly, heavily. <laughs> Ephesians 3, we'll get to it. Uh, verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth is named. The Father in heaven, Paul and the New Testament revelation is God is Father and he's always been Father. He's been the everlasting Father. He's always been Father. Always been Father. I just get this picture yesterday when I was riding my bike again for after a good period of time. And this guy was wheeling with his wife and a couple of kids, the little boy walking, and one was in the stroller. And the kid stood up and he turned around and the father was pushing him and he says, oh, how'd you do that? And he picks him up and he says, that's oh, okay, you can walk with daddy. And I thought, oh God, amen, come on, come on. You see, every father in heaven and on earth derives its identity, its DNA. And fair dinkum, guys, if you want to be great fathers, get a hold of the heart of the father because he's the archetypal father. He's the prototype. He's the model. He's the affectionate father who's always been father and never been anything else but father. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get through this message. <laughs> and do you know what? He's got a family in heaven. And his family is here with us on earth. All the angels are his family. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, what the heck they are, I don't know. I'm going to find out when I get to heaven. But they're here with us because God's intent through Jesus Christ, the miracle of salvation and death and resurrection, is that in John 14 verse 20 something, he says... And all those who obey my commandments. In other words, all those who fall in love with me and walk in the commandment of love because there's only one commandment for the church. Walking in the love of God which will fulfill everything else. Those who, who obey his commandments, walking in love, we will come and make our home in us. How does that happen? Are you kidding me? 1 Corinthians 6 says that you know, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at someone next to you and say, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. One in John 14 it says that we will come and make our home in us. God Almighty, Creator, Divine, Majestic, Magnificent, Amazing, and Creator God comes and makes His home in us. You're sitting next to a house of God filled with gold. Hallelujah. Desiree just said that to Joan. Turned to someone else and said, I'm sitting next to a house of gold. <laughs> Woo, yes. Come on. We are golden vessels in the house filled with God himself. And the thing is, it's, it's, we can stop at the individualization of it, which is a problem in the Bible, where when we read scriptures and we talk about Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's always in the plural. It's not individualized, although that's legitimate. But we individualize things for ourselves at the exclusion of the plural. And the local church is the plural factor and expression of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So we, in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, Together 
We are the temple of the living God. So he says, come out from among them and be separate and I will be what? A father to you. See, the father and the son live in the house. <clears throat> we are that house in this school, in our community, in our workplaces. Wherever we are, we are the house of God where God the Father and the Son is resident. We get our identity from the Father, the archetypal Father, the, the model Father. And because of the ministry of the Father, Heart of God and what we've been doing a lot around the place, the world is becoming continually, increasingly fatherless. You know what? Whether it's any other religion in the world, they will run to a place where they know they'll be loved and, loved and accepted because they're all looking for their dad. The whole world in every nation is looking for the father because he put it in their hearts. It says he has put eternity in the hearts of men. And the eternity is not just to go to heaven but to find the father. I believe we should be out there sharing the heart of the Father with people. Let's just go to John, uh, sorry, um, John, yes, John. I'll just have to shorten this around a bit. John chapter 2, uh, sorry, no it's not, it's Luke I think. <laughs> Luke 2, 49. Oh, I just love, I just love God. Love what he's doing. It's amazing, overawing, just amazing, overawed. This is incredible. You sing a song, it's, this is amazing love. Yeah. It's fantastic, it's true, it's so amazing. That's, you know, it's a jaw-dropping, eye-popping. <laughs> You know, if we have a jaw-dropping, eye-popping experience of the Father, we'll be overawed. And that's what it's all about, just being overawed with wonder at who he is. Where is this scripture? Verse 49. Jesus is 12 years of age. They went to Jerusalem to do the thing, or Bethlehem, or whatever it was, to, for the census. And they're all heading home again, a great, great caravan of, of people gone from all villages back to their birthplace to get registered. And, and he stays back at 12 years of age and he says, and, and the parents are freaking out saying, where is he? We've got to go back and find him. And he says, everyone heard him, uh, sorry, uh, he's sitting in the temple sharing with all the Pharisees and bamboozling them with his revelation of God's heart. Everyone heard him, was amazed in, the, in their understanding of his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have anxiously been searching for you. And he says, Why are you searching for me? He asked, Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? My heart's calling and desire and destiny and DNA is to be where the Father is. And in the Old Testament up to this stage, it was a, a, a house of stone and a glorious, well, originally Solomon's temple was worth billions and billions of dollars with gold and silver and everything else under the sun. But God kept his heart in the house because that was to be the central factor from where everything else went. And he said, and later on he says, don't you know, which we'll read next, that my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. All nations. He took Israel. He selected them out. He specially anointed them, touched them, redeemed them, brought them out of Egypt, set up his kingdom, and set up a house that from that place would radiate to all the nations of the world the power of the glory of God manifest in that nation. That was the intent. That was the intent and it grieved God so much that they kept it to themselves and restrained themselves even to this day trying to understand why this is not happening but God is breaking out and he's touching the world because the house, the house, this house now it's not a house of stone God has moved from the house of stone into the stony hearts of men and turned them into hearts of flesh and he's living in there Whew. Lucky you're not too close here mate, you get a spray 
Jesus had a passion for the house. He felt, that's where I'm to be. That's where I'm to be. If he's our example, where are we to be? A passion for the house. Chapter, John chapter 2. The first time Jesus uh, busted the, the sellers in the temple. The first time. You know, he did it twice. At the beginning and the end of his ministry, he went in and he, he, he blew up the trade marketing that was going on in the house of God. He was angry. He was filled with zeal and passion for the house, it says here. In um, John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Those who saw, uh, he went in and he, uh, he said, um, hang on a sec. There was, uh, verse 13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, or, and others sitting at tables exchanging money in the temple courts. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them out of the temple area, both sheep and cattle, and scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. It's pretty violent. He said to those who sold doves, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a den of robbers. He was driven by a zeal. And then it says here, uh, where am I? He says, in verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will, will consume me. Psalm 76, I think it is. I think I've written it down here somewhere. Zeal for your house. As a 12-year-old, he wanted to be in the Father's house. And, and another scripture in the King James, I think, or King James, New King James says, about my Father's business. So he had to be in the house with his dad and he was imbibing of the father's business for what he was going to do 12, 18 years before he started his ministry. Now when he starts his ministry, he goes back to the house and he evicts the criminals who had turned it into a marketplace because passion and love for God had driven him to drive out the rubbish. He purified the house. If I do, let's take the word zeal, he says, get out of here, how dare you turn my father's house into a market. It says, the, 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 verse 17, zeal for your house will consume me. That's a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. And the passion, uh, the, sorry, the New Living Translation says, passion, passion for God's house burns within me. You know, I believe that we need a fresh touch of a burning passion, understanding what the house is all about, understanding what the local church is all about. We're not an appendage to society. We're not an attachment. We're not just something here waiting for the second coming. We're not a bunch of people getting the best out of life and maybe evangelizing and doing what we can until Jesus comes back. We are it. We are plan A and there's no plan B. We are it, right here. Everyone next to you, you are and I are God's divine collective people here in this place to be an influence of light and salt. And we're going to make a difference and you are making a difference. Amen. Zeal says, for your houses consume me. The Hebrew word says, the Hebrew word for zeal, to devote consuming zeal on one that is loved. To devote consuming zeal on one that is loved. A person, this incident is a house. Because the heart of God was in the house. So in his zeal for the house, it wasn't a religious thing he was doing. It was because of the heart of the Father that he was zealous. You know, in, in the Greek word for this, it says, is the word zealous. Sounds like the bag place, doesn't it? Zealous. Zealous. <laughs> Maybe if they got it from there, it sounds like a Greek word there, doesn't it? Maybe all their bags are sold with passion. <laughs> Zealous, the Greek word from the word, Greek word zeo, to be hot. As in water boiling, or as in substance glowing with fire. Oh, shaka, banda. No interpretation. <laughs> boiling. Boiling. Not with a crazy... Uh, 
ascetic kind of extremist view of stuff where you go in and you just rip into whatever, but a driving power of love and compassion in the heart for the Father. And his intention and his purpose on the earth that we're on fire. <coughs> Electricity, son. <coughs> on fire. Another translation says of Psalm 69 says, My love for you has my heart on fire. My passion consumes me for your house. My heart for you has my heart on fire. My passion consumes me for your house. That's how God feels about us here now. We're not thinking of something back there. This is what he feels about you and me. Can you just... Can we just take this in for a sec? God has a burning, passionate love for us here. The Rock Christian Church in Alexandra Hills. You're in, you and I are it. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just say right now, I'm not finished, but just let there come a revelation of your burning, passionate love for us right now. You have a passion for your house, Father. Jesus demonstrated it. And each one of us are his house. Your body is the house. And the Father has a burning, passionate love for you. Do you see that? You are the house. You are the house. You are the house. Don't put yourself down. Don't wipe yourself out. Don't think I'm insignificant. Don't think that I'm nothing. You are the house and God has a burning passionate love on fire for you now, now, now. You. You. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Oh God, help us to understand we're not just Christians doing some Christian stuff. We're, a, we're the house of God. We're God is burning with a delight and passion for us. You're it. I'm it. Oh, we look at ourselves and we see the terrible flaws. He sees Christ in us. He sees us robed in righteousness. He sees passionate love. We are lovers. He's a lover. <laughs> Come on. Believe it. Say, I believe. I'm the passionate focus of God's love for me. I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Tell the person next door I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Sorry. That's at the end of his ministry before the crucifixion in Matthew 21, Mark 11 and Luke 19 that he said he cleans the house out again. You know, one of the things about the house is God's going to clean the house. He will drive out the stuff. Migraine, headaches, back. Where's Pam? Oh, there. And I seriously believe that God is, is doing things of the increase of his government in the earth, that the manifestation of his love and power comes through signs, wonders and miracles. We do not chase signs, wonders and miracles. But in Matthew 21, when Jesus cleansed the house and he said, this is, a, he quotes um, Psalm, he said, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And that is going to happen. He's being prophetic. He's capturing what was said by the prophet in the Old Testament, re renewing it in the New, and he's prophetically saying, this house, this house, all the houses, local churches, are going to be a house of prayer, praise and worship for all nations because outstandingly the glory of God and the kingdom of God rising in the midst will cause people to be drawn. Prodigals will come to the house where they're loved. So we are, have to be on fire with the passionate love of God. Yeah. And people will be drawn to it. Absolutely. Or where we go out to them. Absolutely. I've lost my place. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't. <sighs> when he cleaned the house, when he cleared the junk, the religiousness, the profiteering, the commercialization, the competition, all the junk. 
of what human beings bring into his church. The blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. The children ran shouting in the temple because the bondage of religion restrained them to sit there and say nothing. And when he cleansed the house, they were liberated. The children were on fire. And they ran through the house. And what did the Pharisees say, the religious people? What are you talking well, about? These kids are running through the house shouting and talking about the glory of God and everything. He said, yes, what? Out of the mouths of babes and suckling have I ordained strength. Yeah. Don't look down on the kids. Yeah. They're going to lead the way. I don't believe that we should be letting kids run riot through our meetings and stuff like that. There should be a sense of order and whatever else, but not that, oh gosh, you know. <laughs> but somehow, someday, God is going to touch kids that are going to do something in the spirit that's going to offend our religiosity. Yeah, are you listening? Oh dear. I wonder why I say some things. <laughs> oh my goodness. I told God he could say what he wanted to. And I'm speaking to myself because I'm really praying over a breakthrough from any kind of religious thing that's within me. The Father is repossessing the house. He's repossessing us. He's taking back what's his because his passionate fire and love will not let him do anything else. And I mentioned before about the fact that in, a, in, um, in Corinthians it says, you know, it talked about the cross. 1 Corinthians 2, he says, if if the principalities and powers had known, if they had known, because they don't know, that Jesus Christ's crucifixion would bring about a whole new revelation, re restoration through the planet, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. <coughs> they would never have crucified the Lord. Why shoot yourself in the foot? But the rage and anger of Satan blinded him and killed the Lord of glory who allowed himself to be killed. And may I say that Jesus determined and organized and constructed the time of his death. He let no man take his life. He said to Pilate, he said, if you, you can't take my life from me unless it's given authority to you. And in earlier times, people wanted to kill him and he walked right through them. <coughs> Why? Because it wasn't time and Jesus knew it and he orchestrated the time of his death. That's how much he was committed to us. That he organized it. That blows me away. Incredible. But Satan didn't know. And he crucified the Lord of glory who rose from the dead and smacked the devil out. Completely took the keys of death and hell and trampled all over him as he came out of the grave. And then Paul says, and God is in, by his authority and intent has given authority to the church to bring down Ephesians 3. Look at this, we'll finish up, don't worry. We are a powerful group of people. We are a people that are most amazing people on all the planet. In, in Ephesians 3 it says, talking about the church it's the church it's the local church and when it says the father the the father of every family named in heaven and on earth on earth it's more generally the local church although it can be every people group there's a bit of a broad thing there but the focus is his church and he says his intent verse 10 was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God which the devil didn't have a clue about and still doesn't should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm according to his eternal purpose. It's for us to let them know what a bunch of blockheads they are. <laughs> They're running, the devil is running around. Now listen, we are so distracted by all the reports of what the devil's doing on the planet. And he's running around in circles and in confusion, throwing hand grenades all over the place saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. To distract the church onto what he's doing. When God is saying, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Yeah. And we are distracted by the hand grenades going off. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Don't be distracted. Yes, there's issues going on on the planet. But what is the Holy Spirit doing that you don't see behind the scenes? And millions and millions of people from all kinds of religions are turning to Christ. I know that firsthand in Indonesia and other places. 
It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the planet, in the church, that's making the difference. In, in Arche, where they, um, I mentioned before maybe, but in Arche where there was a the great tsunami and there was a lot of stuff happening there, it was, it was destined and planned to be Sharia law state. And the church was not allowed to build a building and they were persecuted heavenly. When the tsunami came and God called the Christians up onto the mountain on Christmas Day and the tsunami came on Boxing Day, they were safe, those who listened. And when it all came afterwards, they, those who wanted that Sharia law, said, your God is the real God and now they have 16 churches there freely worshipping God and no Sharia law at all. Come on! I was told this personally in Indonesia on a trip I did just the last time I went there, three or four years ago. You know, see, we are not a pathetic little group hiding away in a schoolroom. No, that's right. You and I are, with God's intention, given the wisdom of God through Christ Jesus and his salvation, to let the rulers and powers know we are winning. And you have no power. In Corinthians it says, I'll read this and I'll finish it off. It says, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We do not speak a message of wisdom among the mature. Sorry, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. But not the wisdom of this age. Or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Come on. Say this, the rulers of this age, the principles and powers of hell, are coming to nothing. When we stand up and we do what God's called us to do in our realm and our phase, we are pushing back stuff. And you don't even have to pray about it. Yes, there's prayer and yes, there's intercession and there's spiritual warfare. I'm not saying there isn't. But the very fact that you are who you are. Someone said to us, and I've had this opinion for a long time, when we move in or we go into a hotel room or I have to stay in a hotel room for a period of time in what I'm doing, I don't even worry, I don't even have a witness in myself to pray against spiritual powers that may have been in there from the people who were there before me. Because when I walk in, I walk in, they walk out. That's true. And someone said, I said, yes! Don't get hung up with the hand grenades. Walk in and take over because you're anointed. You're anointed, you're anointed, you're anointed, you're anointed. Let's finish up. Oh my goodness. I believe this morning that God just wants us to really be reignited on fire that his passion and his fire for the church for his house will burn in us don't just let this be a religious experience that you do on Sunday morning and walk away we are it look around again at those next to you and around you we are the fiery passion of God with his fire in us let's just pray for a moment Oh, Father. Oh, God, help us. Hallelujah, you're amazing. You live in the house. You make your home in the house. You, and we pray that you will be at home in the house. Be at home. That you have full sway. That you are the Lord of the house. That like Jesus as a 12-year-old, he says, I must be in my father's house. I must be about my father's business. Zeal for your house. Boiling, glowing, coals of fire. Love for you. That zeal, that compassion, that passion drove him in compassion and love to drive out the impurities in the house. And we are that house. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your grace on us. <clears throat> May we be thermostats, Lord. Oh, Jesus, turn up, the th turn up the heat. Turn up the heat. Turn up the heat in this house. Turn up the heat in this house. <clears throat> Father, Father, what a precious thing that we can call you Father. Amazing.
Amazing, amazing. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to just come upon us right now. Come, Holy Spirit. <laughs>